Um, as we get some questions coming in, I, I see they've already been coming in, but I'm going to actually start by putting all of our speakers on the spot a little bit. See how much you were paying attention to each other and ask <laughs> if you would be willing to uh, think about a couple management principles that would be applied across these sectors that um, could be used to sort of combat this sort of growing antimicrobial resistance. Piece of cake, biosecurity, it works. <laughs> the, the hog people are talking about it, the dairy people are talking about it, the beef people are talking about it, it works. <laughs> looks like you might be muted, Dr. Fowler. We're not Sorry, hearing Sorry, I muted myself. I'm always afraid I'd unmute myself and, and interrupt others. So what Harley was saying about just kind of record keeping and being able to share that, that information out. So biosecurity, definitely the part two is kind of tracking that and using that to shape behaviors. Definitely, I really liked what Heather was talking about the outreach that they're doing. I think that is a huge part of this One Health concept is getting just that idea out there because a lot of people see just an antibiotic free or no antibiotic ever label and they assume that's the best and the only method when once you're in the industry and you understand how it operates, you know that that's not necessarily that idea. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, biosecurity is actually key and also one health. Uh, if you truly understand what is going on from going on from the general uh, environment of the animal and the human, then you can come up with better management and control strategies. Awesome. Well, thanks for answering that one. <laughs> listening so well to each other's talk. So we'll get into the audience questions here. I'm gonna start with one from Kathy for Dr. Fowler. And this is a sort of the One Health approach and how animals impact the environment. And what, how do you protect the health of neighborhood, of neighbors who are near large scale hog facilities? Does the pork board get involved with in, or encouraging or installing biofilters um, on the pit fans? Does the pork board encourage members to maximize distance between barns and neighborhoods? So that's a great point. You bring out some really great points. And we are actually funding research. We just had an RFP that closed earlier this year looking at environmental health and community health. Um, and one of the things we're trying to understand is better understand the exposures and the um, correlations with exposures and outcomes. We know correlation doesn't equal causation. So we're really trying to understand what are the true exposures and then how can we minimize them? I will say in terms of, I'm oh, sorry, I have the Q&A up there. Oh, you clicked it. So um, we need to also make sure that we don't necessarily associate odors with exposures, right? Odor can be a subjective. Um, if we're talking about dust exposure, you know, those things are really closely tied. Um, and so that can make it really hard from a research perspective to fully understand. Because I can ask you if you live near a barn, do you feel like you can smell it in the morning? You live downstream from a dairy, do you smell it? And then correlate that with a negative health outcome. But is that really real? So once we understand, the better understand that exposure, we can help to develop ways definitely to mitigate exposures um, from farms if there are true health risks associated with them. Good. Thanks. Um, I guess this this question for anybody, um, but you did this uh, talk about organic uh, labeling Dr. Moyle, so maybe I'll, I'll throw it to you. Any thoughts on how organic approaches could help improve animal immune systems or um, help them be resilient to resistant to a disease? You know, that's something people have been looking at for a while. In fact, I did some research on that when I was at ARS before I came to Maryland. And we, we it gets really weird there because some of the things will work in a laboratory, then you try and do it in the field and you have so many other actors at play that you can't control that things don't work the same. And sometimes it may work on your farm, but not on Emmanuel's farm. So, you know, you, there's a lot of stuff in here that we really don't understand and we're working on it. And which compound in that organic product is actually doing the benefit, you know, where we got to isolate down, are we getting the same dosage each time? So there's so many things that we really don't understand. We're, and there's a lot of research going on looking into those things as we speak. If anyone else has a thought on that, um, on organic practices and impacts on AMR, um, feel free to jump in. 
Um, otherwise, so there's a question here for Dr. Fowler, but it, it also touches on some things that Dr. Moyle was talking about. So maybe either one of you wanna uh, jump in here. It says, based on the FDA sales data, uh, use of medically important antimicrobials in pigs declined of 43% since the VDF was approved. But it has edged up to near pre-VDF levels um, by about 30% in 2018 to 2019. Do we know why this may have occurred and what steps can be taken to reverse the trend? So do, yeah, so that's a great question. Do we have a definitive answer? The short answer is no, but we know things can change, right? Disease incidents can change. We know the population may not be, do we produce 2 million or 3 million or 2.5? So understanding that denominator piece is important as well when we're looking at that sales data, which is really that numer numerator value. So there are different things that can explain it, um, but we don't have a pinpoint on any one given issue. Other folks on the panel have thoughts? I think you made an important thing is, is what did population of swine go up during that time? If so, the amount of actually used per swine has gone down. So there's there's all these things at play that we really don't have a tough uh, thing on. And if I remember right, you also had, uh, oh, what was the disease that was going through there for a while? EVD, uh, man. EDV. That's it. Uh, too many epidemic diarrhea, yep. Yeah. So we had a lot of disease pressures and stuff going on too as well. And, and we want to take care of animals. That, that's paramount. I mean, we're not going to abuse animals in, in any way, shape or form at any time. And I will say that, you know, the FDA is collecting the data they have access to from a national perspective. And then one of the, the activities we're doing with tracking antibiotics is, again, being able to tell our story from the industry perspective and, again, allowing the individual producer to adapt as needed. And so you might see peaks and troughs, but um, likely uh, related to different disease incidents or, you know, it, again, it could be a break in, in biosecurity or a really cold front that was no one was expecting and we didn't drop the curtains or those types of things automated or not drop the curtains put them up um so those types of things. So the curtains go the other way right so um so, so lots of different factors that can be tied to that but great question awesome so there's a couple questions here about the size of a poultry facility um so maybe you can clarify either john or harley in terms of um, what what is the difference between lower soccering density when we're seeing larger operations and and how it kind of square the two of those things? You know, that's that's a great question. And, and I understand where they're coming from. We are seeing larger farms. And be honest with it, reason for that is a lot of that is because of government regulations and the things we have to meet for stormwater and environmental issues and all these other things. So size of farms has gotten larger. The other thing on that, though, that I think they're coming from is they're seeing more housing, but those houses don't have as many birds as they would have, say, five or 10 years ago. They would have had a lot more birds in that house. So now instead of having four houses, I have to have five houses of birds for the same number of birds. So as we're seeing, the, the density is the birds per square foot, so to say, whatever that number happens to be. It varies across the industry based upon what size birds are growing. Mm -hmm. It depends on the companies. Not all companies are the exact same. But as we're seeing people put less birds in a house, for example, if we did a 10% increase in space and went from, say, a, a one foot per bird, this is just numbers, it's not accurate, but one foot per bird to 1.1 foot per bird, that's a 10% increase. Now, all of a sudden, I need 10% more housing. So that's one reason we're seeing these houses. We're seeing larger houses, too, because we can control them easier. Mm -hmm. And if you look at farms that are being built, and I see you have Maryland listed there as well. Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. If you look at a farm in Maryland, we have stormwater treatment plant. I mean, stormwater treatment on all our farms. The water is collected from the storm runoff from all the production areas. It goes through swales where the grasses pull out nutrients. It goes into a forebay where we can actually pull more nutrients out before it even goes into a pond where it stays and doesn't actually exit the farm in most cases. So we're really looking at ways to protect the environment and doing that on a larger scale is much more economical and feasible than it is to do it on a smaller scale. Harley, did you have something to add? No, you summed up beautifully. I think the big thing for that is you are seeing, like you said, those larger houses, but there's, there's method to the madness, I guess is the way I say it. The larger houses are a result of some of the extra requirements that we have to put in. Um, but even though you are necessarily seeing a larger house, the amount of birds that are going placed into that house is much lower than what it previously had been years before. And that's there's a lot of factors that are going into that, such as, you know, the target weight for that bird or the strain of that bird and so on. I'm going to skip down here to a question from uh, 
Derma, I think it is, it kind of gets to the heart of what we're discussing is how do we measure the success of preventing the spread of resistant microbes to the environment? So I guess anyone can answer that. It's a, it's a hundred million dollar question, but uh, have at it, I guess. <laughs> I will start as the public health veterinarian and give you a historical example. So we talk or we joke in the public health world that we're doing too good of a job at sometimes by reducing disease incidents, right? So how do we share the story of, you know, public health at working? That's, hey, if we can get folks vaccinated for influenza, for whatever condition, um, we rarely eliminate a disease, but we can reduce that. And so it's only when, um, We've, we've seen more and more people move away from vaccines and we're seeing those vaccine preventable diseases pop up again. So I, I guess that's my way of saying it's tough to measure the success without um, knowing what exactly that metric is, right? Are we continuing to, we can start to look at specific resistant bugs and see if that continues, but that's evolutionary. These bugs will continue to evolve um, and change and shift. And we know even with responsible use that we continue to see resistance. So it is a really tough question to um, answer, but we know that we should be continuing to do the right thing or continuing to learn of what's working, what's not, so that we can keep that down, though we might not always say, see, I can prove that we've improved this. And you make a great point, and that is these bugs have been around a hell of a lot longer than we have. And they've been fighting each other. And if you look at what we use for antibiotics or what they use against each other, so they've been exposed to this for billions of years before we even came on the scene. And, and so I, I really don't see a way to ever get rid of resistance completely. But again, by using common sense approaches, biosecurity, you know, not just, just simple things, we can help reduce the chances of making things pop back up in their genetics. Okay, so a couple questions on the One Health certified program. Um, so this could be for Harley or John. Um, and this is kind of getting into, there was a report, I guess, uh, I think it was consumer reports on how effective those One Health certified programs really would be in terms of comparison to what the industry was already doing. I'm assuming, well, maybe I shouldn't assume, but Harley, your farm was probably as an early adopter already doing a lot of these practices. So how much different is it? And um, how do you sort of envision that program? I know you discussed it sort of an improvement program. What is that process like to sort of improve the requirements of that program and, and how effective do you see that that will be in terms of uh, changing those practices for not only your farm, but the industry in general? Um, so, I mean, you do make a valid point. A lot of these are practices that most poultry producers already have in place and things like that. Um, I think the big key difference with One Health and it being a USDA audited program, um, there is a large amount of traceability and paperwork that goes into it that not every producer does. Um, so, you know, our serial treatment trackers, um, our root cause analysis, we have records dating back almost three years, you know, including when we were starting the program and going forward with that. Um, so the record keeping is a big part of it. And I know it kind of sounds like a small thing, um, but when you're able to show what's going on and how it's changed over those years, it's a big difference. Um, and as far as the continuous improvement program goes, so like I said, the One Health certified program as a whole is owned by Niamri. Um, so their key focus is research onto antimicrobial resistance. Um, so as more research comes out and they continue to do the research on what's going on, um, they can feed back what's happening and we can change the guidelines to match that research accordingly. Okay, so... Um... There's, there's still a lot more questions here. I don't know we'll get to them all, but um, uh, how about, uh, are there any new strategies for encouraging more individual animal care? Um, this, I guess, would be touching on a lot of those preventative and biosecurity measures, um, but they continue using injectable antimicrobials, perhaps, or uh, to reduce overall use and load on the environment. You know, that, that's an interesting question because in the poultry industry, we treat things as a flock. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that in swine, often it's a herd where we get to cattle and stuff. A lot of times we'll go to individuals. 
Um, one of the things I've seen some, some talk on in that is robotics, as we become more aware of what robotics can do, because it's, it's very labor intense to try and give injectables. Again, we're, we're talking 9.2 billion chickens a year in the United States. If you think about how long that would take to inject every one of those animals, or even just the sick ones, you're, you're talking about a massive undertaking. I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens as we move forward with some of these robotics that are able to assess situations in houses and then help take corrective actions. And I will add to that, um, to your point, John, that um, it also depends on the pathogen and then how the animals are housed. Part of the issue is if we're talking influenza, it will move through a, a facility very quickly. With hogs, we often have them in different rooms. So there is the option potentially, depending on where the animal is at the time it becomes sick, to, to isolate the animals in those rooms, right? To, to treat the sick, to control disease there, however you do that, depending on whether it's vaccine, whether it's antibiotics, et cetera. Um, so we need to keep that in mind um, and constantly recognize that how that pathogen can shift that. But we are, um, I will say that we're teaching in vet school and I took some courses at Iowa State as well. We're teaching the students to look at the facility, then come in to the facility and walk through to look at a room and then focus on the individual. We are teaching them that way. And I know with some of the pharmaceutical areas, um, industries, excuse me, they're also teaching about some individual pig care. But as you said, there's times when the herd is impacted and you need to treat the herd. So it really is case dependent, unfortunately, such is medicine. Yeah, those are really great points raised there. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit when it comes to the dairy industry, well, we do, uh, do treat individual animals, but also do treat animals at a hard level. But really, uh, one thing that comes to my mind is diagnostics. It's really important to be able to identify the organism causing the infection and can guide whether you're treating an individual animal or a group of animals. You make a very good point, and that it always cracks me up that when we have sick chickens, we can tell you what antibiotic is going to work because we test it and we go through all that. Yet if I go to the doctor, she just gives me whatever she thinks is going to work. We don't test it. I've always thought it was interesting. We test for our animals, but for our humans, we just ah, try this. That doesn't work. You know. I like my doctor, by the way. I, I want to throw that out there. <laughs> Uh, so there's one question, and this one comes up a lot on AMR stuff because it's a genetic thing. Is there a way to sort of genetically engineer a way out of it to produce animals that are effectively disease free? I don't know how everyone would like to eat those, but um, is that even a possible thing? Say that again. Um, any that thoughts again, about sorry. genetic engineering approaches to produce disease free animals? You know, genetic engineering, it depends on what you're talking about. Right now, we do look at the genomes of these animals that are selected for breeders at, at the upper levels. So we are, but we're not playing with the genes. We are just looking for animals that carry the genes that we currently want. And we are identifying which genes do cause which resistance to different uh, diseases. So that is currently being done, not where they're manipulating the genes. I want to make sure that's stated. We're just looking for individuals that carry the genes that we're wanting to be able to path on that resistance to, to their offspring. Exactly. So that's a, a great comment in terms of how we can, I don't like to say genetically manipulate, but how we through selective breeding can get there. There has been some research in swine around um, genetically engineered um, resistant hogs. And I think that's something that will be continued to explore. But one of the questions is, will the consumer accept it, right? We've seen breakthroughs in the dairy industry, right? That um, helped with production, helped with the bottom line. But at the end of the day, the, it became an inverse marketing, right? you know, free of this. And so we, we do need to think about those things. And this is again, a one health issue. If you're breeding animals that are resistant to this, this that will positively impact their welfare, right? If they're no longer susceptible and don't have to go through the suffering, if you will, of being um, sick with that disease. So something that we'll continue to explore through research um, and outreach throughout the years. All right. So before we wrap up, I'm just gonna ask all the speakers if, if you feel like we're leaving something out on this discussion of AMR and livestock production, um, what did we really, what do you really hope that the audience is gonna take away from this? There is something I do need to add and Greg Martin put it in their questions. And that is when we're talking about larger farms, whether it's swine, whether it's chicken, whether it's dairy, 
vegetative buffers around them can be very beneficial to help with odor. It can help with dust. And it can also, there's, there's actually some data out there showing that it actually helps control any of the pathogens or any of the bacteria from leaving the farm. So I do want to, I want to thank Greg for reminding me of that because we do a lot of work with vegetative buffers to help. And I will add that I saw that comment as well, and I, I will look into that. So I cover primarily the public health AMR food safety space, and I have a, a colleague that covers the environmental health space. So I'm a little bit out of my wheelhouse here. So I appreciate that reminder. And I know that some producers have um, done some of that. You might drive up the highway and see a just a ring of trees and you're like, well, that's strange. There's a pig farm in the middle of that. So they have been looking at that. I know that from experience, but I'm not um, completely up to date on on that research there, but I know my, my colleague is. So thanks for again for making that comment for others to see.